One of the most infamous unsolved murder cases in all of American history is that of the Zodiac Killer. While nobody has ever been officially charged with his crimes, he was responsible for four victims in 1968 and 1969. He had sent at least 32 letters containing codes to newspapers during this period, as some containing ciphers that have yet to be decoded. His motives are unclear, but many believe he wanted to get caught. Joseph DeMott of Vallejo, California, was the first of the Zodiac's victims on December 20th, 1966. The following, September 27th, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen were shot dead, all while parked on Lumbers Lane in Benicia, California, where they had lived. Two months later, on November 29th, Mike Mago and Darlene Farron were both shot outside of Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo, California. Mago survived, but Farron died on the scene. A man claiming to be the Zodiac called Vallejo Police and admitted to killing her. In a letter written by a man claiming to be the infamous Zodiac, he said his name was Sam. In a follow-up letter, the killer wrote, Me equals 37-year-old white male, which seemed to match Joseph DeMott, who was also 37 years old at the time of his death. The only problem is that DeMott's family has never been able to accurately verify whether or not this is true, leading many to believe and speculate it is not him. There were also reports of another man being questioned by police in connection with these same crimes, who had the same name. It is still unclear that whether or not this was a false lead. However, the case has never been solved. The Zodiac called himself the genius in many of his letters to newspapers, even sending codes that have yet to be deciphered. He made demands for his ciphers to be published, which led some people to believe that he wanted to get caught referencing one man who would publish his code in the paper when he grew tired of living with it. What had him so obsessed with cryptology? Was there something about these crimes he wanted to tell us without actually telling us what happened? Coded messages from an unidentified serial killer are as creepy as they come. The Zodiac continued to make threats and demands in his letters to newspapers, but it wasn't until September 27, 1974, that he made another major move. State Assemblyman and gubernatorial candidate Don Mulford was shot dead outside the Capitol building in downtown Sacramento. The killer had sent a letter with a piece of one victim's shirt, along with the demand that all gun control legislation be repealed, or else more would die. It is still unclear whether the Zodiac was involved at this time, but he had sent letters about other events. In 1999, a woman by the name of Kathleen Johns and her infant daughter were driving through the area when their car failed to turn on Highway 132, which is east of Modesto, California. This resulted in an accident involving another driver. A man stopped to help them, but instead of helping, he tied them up, forced her into his truck. He blindfolded her and drove off with her, while her daughter was left behind in the car that had crashed. After hours of driving around at night, the man stopped at an intersection where she was able to jump out while he wasn't looking. She ran towards the house screaming for help, which alerted the owner who called police. Police arrived on the scene quickly, but by this time, Kathleen's kidnapper had long since disappeared. When they interviewed Johns, she told police that her kidnapper claimed to be the Zodiac before forcing her into his car at gunpoint and driving off. The fact that John's kidnapper claimed to be the Zodiac and left her alive leads some people to believe that there may have been a second killer. However, the case remains unsolved. The following year on March 22nd, two high school students named Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were picnicking at Lake Berryessa in Napa County. This is when they were approached by a man who had stabbed them both with an ice pick before pulling out a handgun and demanding their wallet and car keys. Once they gave him what he wanted, he tied them up and made them face each other and told Shepard to watch as he killed Hartnell. He then stabbed him over and over again in the upper back and once in each leg before turning his attention to Cecilia. He stabbed her four times, 
leaving three more wounds on her body just for good measure. Hartnell pretended to be dead, while Shepard played dead as well. Once the man left, they untied themselves and ran towards a nearby house, screaming for help. The police did not arrive there until 3.15 p.m., which means that there was a fairly long time between when they were stabbed and when the police had arrived, meaning more things could have happened. They had no information about who attacked them or why, but many believe this is another attack committed by the Zodiac Killer, due to how similar it sounds to the other crimes he had committed, including making odd demands after killing somebody. Hartnell survived his injuries, but Shepard died from hers. This means the killer was never caught. In 2004, the police department in Napa County offered a $1 million reward for information leading to his arrest and conviction. However, there have been no new leads since then. The Zodiac Killer claimed that he had killed 37 people, although only seven were actually confirmed by law enforcement officials throughout the state of California. These letters were sent by the Zodiac. They are strange. They include specific details about each murder, along with vague threats, aimed at anybody who may or may not be him. Some experts believe these messages are part of an elaborate ruse, where he is encouraging police to release more information about cold cases. These letters were sent during 1969 and 1974. This means he was active for only five or so years. His last letter was apparently received on November 8, 1974, before abruptly stopping, as if he had either been caught or died. Although, there were several suspects, including Arthur Lee Allen, who was confirmed as the Zodiac Killer by DNA evidence years later. However, they could never tie him to any of the unsolved cases. He was never actually convicted of any crime, although he is now deceased. While there is still much speculation about who the Zodiac Killer actually was, it is very likely that Arthur Lee Allen was the man who terrorized Northern California throughout the 60s and the 70s. Allen, who was born in Santa Clara County, California, on February 12, 1931, he is believed to have been the person behind the Zodiac killings, although not much information has been released about him due to his death in 1992. There are several things that point towards him being behind these crimes. One such thing is the fact that he lived in the same area during 1968, which makes it very likely that he would have known all of his victims personally. They were abducted within a few blocks of where he had lived. He also had a long history of peeping Tom activities throughout his high school and college years, which might explain why he wore a mask. Despite using a number of different weapons and methods, there were always some similarities between each attack, leading authorities believe that they were all committed by the same person. These common traits including demanding odd things, such as, I want her car, and $300 in small unmarked bills, posing with cryptid messages, written in blood besides his victims, and mailing taunting notes. These often include complicated ciphers that he claimed would reveal his true identity, if they were ever decoded. While it is clear that Allen was most likely the Zodiac Killer, due to there being no hard evidence linking him directly to any of his crimes, many still doubt this theory because of how circumstantial all the evidence sits. There are also some skeptics who believe that Allen may have been only an accomplice, which means there could be more killings still out there that remain unsolved, even today. Apparently, Arthur Lee Allen was also identified as the most likely suspect in the Zodiac killing, thanks to DNA testing not available at the time of his death in 92. Evidence found on a ski mask worn by the killer during an infamous killing spree points conclusively to Allen as being responsible for all five crimes detailed in a famous police letter attributed to the serial murderer. Overall, the Zodiac killer is suspected in five separate slings. Cecilia Shepard and Brian Hartnell in September of 1969, both stabbed by an attacker wearing a hooded costume, including a white crossed circle emblem on his chest. The assailant then wrote he was Zodiac in knife blood at the crime scene. Fast forward to July of 1970, police believe that the same man may have shot 20-year-old David Faraday 
and 17-year-old Betty Lou Jensen to death as they sat in the car on Lake Herman Road. One or both bodies were found outside the car. Using a flashlight, the killer shot 22-year-old Darylin Farron at Blue Rock Springs Golf Course on July 4, 1969, all before turning his gun on 17-year-old Michael Magoo. Police believe Allen was behind all five of these attacks, since he lived near each crime scene. The Zodiac Killer is suspected of having famous actress Sharon Tate during a killing spree that involves high-profile murders committed by Charles Manson's family, which also led to many believe that there's some connection between the cases, although it's theory and speculation at best and has never been fully proven. During the time of his death, Arthur Lee Allen was living in San Francisco with his wife. He is said to have died in 1992 at the age of 58. However, it wasn't until after 99 that police had officially obtained a sample of his DNA, which they then tested against various pieces of evidence found at crime scenes. This proved to be the final piece of convincing evidence linking him to one or more killings. Will we ever know the truth? Probably not. These are several cold case files. This first one is about a murder in Chicago, happening on November 16th, 1949. The victim was male. The murder weapon used for this crime was an unknown weapon. It took place at the University of Chicago. The victim was found with four gunshot wounds, two in his chest and two in his left thigh. There was also a fifth apparent gunshot wound in his right shoulder, which looked as if it had been made after the other four wounds were made. This would be hard to tell, though, due to decomposition of the body. The name of the victim is currently unknown, and there were no suspects for the crime. Another one revolves around another murder, occurring on September 13, 1990, in a hotel room located in Texas. The victim was a Hispanic male, between 18 and 23 years of age, with a height of 5 feet 7 inches tall, weighing around 170 pounds. The cause of death was determined as multiple number of stab wounds from a knife or a dagger-like object, up to six blows penetrating deep into the chest cavity and severed major blood vessels. The victim was found with brown work pants, white socks, and a black belt. There was also a gold chain around the victim's neck. His shoe sizes were not found at the crime scene, but are believed to be around 9.5 or 10 EE. There are no suspects for this case, nor are there any known motive for the murder. The only significant piece of information that was gathered from this crime scene is that it is possible that the killer drank alcohol after murdering the victim, due to the alcohol bottles were seen near the body. This could be used as important details. It would narrow down who would have committed the crime. The third case was a murder occurring on July 24, 1997 in South Carolina. The victim was a Caucasian male, light brown hair with blue eyes. He was believed to be rather short, five feet tall, between the ages of 30 and 36 when deceased. The victim's clothing consisted of a gray Adidas shirt, three black stripes in the middle, size XXL, blue jeans and white socks, and two rings, one on his left hand, ring finger, and another on his right pinky. A watch was also found on the scene, but there were no specific details for it, so it cannot be identified as to what brand or style it is from. It is believed and speculated that the victim was shot with a 25 caliber automatic handgun, but no bullets were found at the crime scene, or bullet casings. The cause of death was determined as a hemorrhage or severe bleeding, due to a major artery being cut by a sharp object. There were also two indications of multiple stab wounds near the heart, and a single stab wound in his head, which would have been enough to kill him instantaneously, if inflicted first. Drug-related since two marijuana cigarettes were sitting on top of a nightstand beside the bed where the body was found. There are still no suspects for this crime, even though some eyewitnesses came forward, saying they saw an unidentified male leaving the crime scene and running away. Other information gathered from this crime scene is that there is no forced entry, meaning that either the victim knew whoever killed him, or they had used a master key to enter his room. While there are many more cold case files just like these, all of them have at least one thing in common. 
no suspects, motives, or answers for them, even though there are some eyewitnesses that have come forward, but not enough to give specific information or details that could potentially help investigators solve the crime. The Murder of Kathy Moulton Kathy was an 18-year-old college freshman at the University of Vermont. She was found dead at her family's vacation home in Smartsville, California, on May 28, 1973. According to reports, her body was found face down on the floor next to a twin bed in the guest bedroom with one sandal nearby. The other sandal was never located. It seemed likely that she had been strangled as there were visible marks around her neck. She had also received multiple blows to her head. Although investigators have noted that they believed it to be an isolated incident, there have not been any leads since this time whoever murdered Kathy still remains at large and is still a mystery. The murder of Mary Agnes Klinsky. This girl was the 19-year-old who had been reported missing on June 29, 1973. When she didn't return home from attending a party with friends, police began investigating on their own. Over a month later, on July 28th, her body was discovered in a wooded area near Route 9 West and the Henry Hudson Parkway in New York City. Investigators uncovered that there were actually two gunshot wounds to her head, but they could not find any evidence as to where it might have occurred. Since this time, there have been no leads or suspects as to who may have killed Mary Agnes Klinsky, and she has joined the ranks of many other missing persons cases whose perpetrator still remains at large, the murder of Margaret Chandler. Chandler was born on June 22, 1921. On November 21, 1949, she had left her home to go visit a friend in the neighborhood, but apparently had never made it there. Four days later, her body was discovered, and it appeared as if she had been beaten before being strangled with a piece of clothing believed to be either a stocking or an electrical cord. This case has some very unusual elements associated with it, as one year after the murder, an unknown man called detectives working the case, giving them information regarding to where they believed they might find evidence at pointing to who killed her. The caller had never met nor heard of Margaret Chandler and would not give his name to investigators, but he did tell them that he would call back at a later date. This information was never acted upon as the man who called was never heard from again. No other leads have been discovered to this day. In addition to the three cases mentioned above, the following are just some of the many thousands of unsolved murders that remain on the record with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Kathy Augustine, a 17-year-old girl who had gone missing in 1980 after leaving her home to go jogging near her own house. She has yet to be found in an unknown male seen talking to her before she disappeared sort of set things into motion as to what might have happened. Barbara Jean Monaco, another 21-year-old woman found dead in her home on December 11, 1981. Although it is believed that she knew the assailant, police have not been able to discover who this person might be. No suspects have ever been brought forward. Harold Coyle, a 25-year-old man who was shot after being kidnapped during an apparent robbery attempt on September 3, 1982. His body has never been found, so he could reasonably be considered missing persons victim. However, if his murder or murderers are eventually caught, these cases may become homicides. Lynn Knight, a 21-year-old woman who had disappeared from Salt Lake City, Utah after having run out of gas while en route to visit friends in nearby Provo on November 22, 1985. She has never been seen again and could have been a victim of foul play. John Doe, a.k.a. Briar Pipe Road Jane Doe, is the case of an unidentified female murdered in Greenville County, South Carolina, on February 11, 1994. She had been shot to death after being bound with her hands behind her back. Her killer has never been discovered or brought to justice for this crime. Edward Frank Manuelin Jr., a 57-year-old man who was last seen one day prior to Thanksgiving, November 22, 1985. His body discovered nearly three weeks later close to his home. But, despite such a long time having passed since his disappearance has no new leads, 
or has ever come up regarding why he went missing or who killed him. James Scott, a 20-year-old man who was last seen on April 29, 1986, he was headed out to his part-time job at a gas station near his house. He never made it. Nobody has ever come up with any information regarding to what might have happened to him. Arthur Lee Seawall, a 37-year-old man, father of five children who went missing after leaving Massachusetts on March 27, 1988. His body was found not long after, apparently shown that he had been shot in the head at close range. Police still do not know who or why. Pamela Ann Wright, a 25-year-old woman who disappeared from her Arlington, Texas apartment on February 23, 1993. She was never seen again. The only clue that might help unravel this mystery is a videotape she had supposedly made. On it, she claims to have uncovered details of a sex scandal involving the U.S. House of Representatives members, Wilbur Mills and Fan Fox, also known as the Argentine Firecracker, Charles Christopher Loring, a teenage male who had disappeared from the area around his Wakefield, Massachusetts home on June 9, 1993. His bicycle was found discarded, not far away, but there has been no sign of him since, and despite an extensive search by authorities, he has never been located or discovered. Any leads regarding what might have happened to him are nil. In November of 2010, Joseph and Summer McStay and their two young sons went missing from San Diego, California on February 8, 2013. A few years later, the bodies of the family were found buried in the desert near Victorville, California by a motorcyclist who was out for a ride. After an investigation into the home computer hard drives, it was discovered that on December 28, 2010, somebody had used the Google search, how to kill somebody and not get caught, hiring Hitman, and what happened with Hannah Earl. There was also another search for French vanilla extract, which, when used properly, can be used as a lethal poison. The three searches were done just hours before the family had left their house, accompanied with their two dogs. On February 6th, just days before the family's disappearance, somebody had used the computer to do another search on how to kill with poisons, this time, specifically, French vanilla bean. There are also rumors that in early 2010, Joseph had met with an individual who provided him with some sort of concrete job. However, it is unknown if he ever went to meet them in person. After searching his house and computers, there were no emails or phone records about this job offer, which is peculiar, because in order for him to gain access to these documents, they would have had to have been deleted manually without using any form of technology, which would have left behind evidence of their deletion. Many believe that the mixed stays have been involved in organized crime due to an investigation by the San Diego County Sheriff's Department in early 2012. A few months before the family disappeared, officers had visited their house after receiving a call about somebody screaming, finding four men at the home. No charges were filed, but officers reported that they did find narcotics, which was never specified further. However, it may have been drugs of some sort. Investigators are still trying to piece together what ultimately caused this family to abandon their lives and go into hiding, allegedly with another person involved who had knowledge of poisons or hired hitmen. All texts, emails, phone calls, bank statements, etc. are being thoroughly investigated for any lead whatsoever, but no further details have been released as of late 2014. Even as of now, five years later, there are still very little clues that can shed light on this case and what resulted in the disappearance of the McStay family. The Green River Killer was active and known to kill and dump the bodies of prostitutes and runaways in Washington State. This serial killer's M.O. was to strangle his victims, most of who were African-American women, although males of other races were included. The Green River Killer is officially credited with 49 murders of young women between 1982 and 1984, although he may have killed more, but has never been brought to justice due to police mishandling evidence during the initial years of investigation. For example, testing for DNA did not exist at that time. Gary Ridgway, 
was arrested in 2001. After DNA analysis linked him to some of the crimes, he confessed to killing many of them, dumping their bodies along the bank near Kent, Washington. However, he was never fully convicted of the Green River killings and has been sentenced to life in prison for several convictions of murder. On the other side of the country, in the state of New York, another serial killer was active. Joel David Rifkin. He killed around 18 prostitutes between 89 to 93 before he was caught. He became known as the Long Island serial killer due to dumping many of his victims' bodies all throughout Long Island's county, east and near Jones Beach State Park. This location has become known as Body Dump Site. His arrest resulted from a traffic stop. Police found him standing over his final victim with a pocket knife in his hand. Police also found handcuffs, an ice pick, shovels, trash bags, and bleach inside of his vehicle. He confessed to killing them all, but pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. This put things in a different light, as now, police had to consider that the disappearance of prostitutes and runaways were not missing voluntarily. These two men claimed they committed these murders for personal reasons. So, we will never know if their claims are valid or exaggerated. Both serial killers wanted and still want fame and attention. It is possible that this is what drove them to commit such horrible crimes against innocent victims who had no way out of their traps. The families of the victims of both men have been suffering from a lack of resolution surrounding their loved ones' deaths, which makes their suffering more agonizing with each passing year. As time goes on without answers about what happened to their family members, and a few cases where arrests were made, a local news coverage played a role in identifying another victim, a young girl from Canada whose mother had been in contact with a journalist there in hopes that press coverage would help find her daughter. The families and friends of the victims have no closure regarding their loved ones' fates, and many questions surrounding each case remain unanswered, including what actually transpired during the disappearances and murders? Why would anybody want to kill innocent people who posed no threat? Will these cases ever get solved? And if they do, will it be too late for justice to take its place in courtrooms around the country, where men, known as serial killers, stand trial for their crimes against humanity? Or will it take another decade or two before this happens? The Oakland County Child Killer is one of the most notorious serial killers in American history. He was believed to have murdered at least four children in Michigan, and one child that was found was to believe to be just a fraction of his actual body count. The cases remain one of the most intriguing unsolved crimes in both states' histories. On February 15, 1976, 12-year-old Mark Stebbins disappeared on his way from home to an appointment with a dentist for an incomplete permanent retainer. Five days later, February 19th, 12-year-old Jill Robinson went missing while heading home from a choir practice after school. Their bodies were discovered four days later, on February 23rd. Both had been strangled, which led investigators to believe they were lured at some point or another. Detectives believe that a serial killer may have been the culprit of a string of unsolved cases involving missing or murdered victims. The case has remained unsolved for decades. However, recent major advancements in science and technology may bring an end to this 40-plus-year-old case. On December 22, 1976, a couple out for a day in the snow discovered 13-year-old Timothy King's body along Interstate 75 in Troy, Michigan. He had been reported missing the night before when his mother realized he never made it home after school. Like Mark Steppens and Jill Robinson, he, too, was strangled with his clothes. It was believed that King was also kidnapped while walking or riding his bike home from school, just like the previous victims. Four months later, on April 16, 1977, another youngster went missing. 12-year-old Christine Melica disappeared at a 7-Eleven in Berkeley, Michigan. She was there to purchase a magazine and disappeared before meeting up with her friends who were waiting in the car outside. Three days later, her body was found at the side of a dead-end road in neighboring Franklin Village. The autopsy showed that she had been smothered prior to being buried alive. That same day of Christine's discovery, authorities announced they knew who did it. 
Chris Bush, the son of General Motors executive Robert Bush, who had an interest in photography and apparently abducting children. Police believe that he managed to lure both Mark and Timothy into his van, pretending to be an authority figure, like an FBI agent, or another authoritative figure, like a police officer. This led to the trust of Mark, and ultimately, his death. Bush had apparently used the same method to murder Timothy, with Bush strangling him with his own hands. Both victims, Mark and Timothy, were killed just days apart from each other around the same time. Police also had samples of Bush's semen, which they believe were left at both the abduction scenes, as well as the scene where Christine was found. There is also evidence that ties Chris Bush to several child homicides all around the area between 1972 to 1977, including the murders of Jill, but especially Christine. Despite all this evidence, Bush was never actually convicted of any of the charges. He had only been picked up on child pornography in 1978. He was sentenced to one year at a federal health institution located in Springfield, Missouri. However, while incarcerated, he managed to escape by stealing his grandfather's car and fleeing the facility. During his time on the run, it is believed that Mr. Bush broke into several homes around Ohio, murdering three more victims, aged 8 to 10, before ultimately committing suicide on April 13, 1979, via carbon monoxide poisoning inside his garage. His car was found two days earlier, but authorities did not enter the home during that time, due to it being locked up tightly. With no concrete evidence to pursue actual convictions against Mr. Bush, he was never charged with the murders of Mark, Timothy, Christine, nor any of the other victims. And many people believe that he is responsible for many more unsolved crimes in addition to what's been mentioned. However, this will forever go down as an unsolved case due to the lack of evidence proving his guiltiness. The only real piece of substantial evidence found at all the crime scenes was a single hair belonging to somebody other than the victims. Police were hopeful that it would lead them to their killer, but unfortunately, they've come up empty-handed, and this case remains open and unsolved after several decades have passed since then. Although, we hope one day, we might see some closure on the case. The Rajneesh Param community was an intentional city in Wasco County, Oregon, briefly governed by the Rajneesh movement. The population varied between several hundred and a few thousand at its peak during the early 1980s. The intentional community was developed by a building designer, Antelope, an unincorporated hamlet in Wasco County, to over 30,000 square feet. After changing its name, it became known as Rajneesh until 1985. The commune collapsed in 85 when the leader, now called Osho, was arrested for immigration fraud. He agreed to pay $400,000 worth of fines and began controversial therapies with other leaders. The group subsequently became known as the Rajneesh. In 1985, there were a number of unsolved murders at the commune that received press attention. In 1984, Osho's personal secretary, Sheila, pleaded guilty in federal court to attempted murder and conspiracy for her participation in the 1984 bioterror attack. Two other people who assisted with the attack also pleaded guilty to very similar charges. Oregon Attorney General David B. Foymayer identified a total of 13 members of the organization who had been charged with or were convicted of crimes related to bioterror attacks, including one member who was murdered, apparently by fellow followers of Osho. In addition to the attack, the United States Attorney Charles H. Turner prosecuted other crimes including a murder for which May Anand Puja was convicted in federal court and others that were committed locally by followers of Osho. In late 1985, a year after the end, a Belgian filmmaker made several trips from Antwerp to Wasco County where she had conducted interviews with the locals. She found many people who were deeply ambivalent about their memories, experiences, and opinions regarding events related to the community many people felt that they were deceived by the followers, while some residents feared retaliation if they spoke out against the commune. 
Some interviewees were happy to share their experiences and opinions, while others flat out refused to talk or only gave very short, vague answers. This filmmaker decided to focus on the latter group for her documentary. In an interview with the retired Wasco County Sheriff's Department sergeant, he described the commune as a police state, run by Sheila. The film that was released in 2011 and received mixed critical reception. It premiered at the Warsaw International Film Festival, where it has shared a special mention with another Belgian production about the same commune called Duchess of Kalamazoo. In October of 1985, months after Sheila pleaded guilty to attempted murder, she attempted to gain political control over the nearby town of Antelope, Oregon, by running for mayor. She was elected with 53% of the vote, but resigned after five weeks in office. Reporters had revealed her previous crimes. A Netflix original docu-series has been released on March 16th, titled Wild Wild Country, which presents the story and highlights the power struggles that ensued between the commune leaders and local residents. It also sheds light on how the commune collapsed shortly after the deportation from the United States. This documentary, though, has also drawn criticism over its bias towards the member of the commune, giving them significantly more screen time than local characters who oppose the commune. You'll just have to watch this documentary yourself and decide what you think. The disappearance of Nicholas Barclay is still unsolved to this day. On the evening of January 12, 1990, 16-year-old Nicholas was babysitting his two sisters and two brothers while their parents were out of town on a business trip. When they got home that night, around 11 p.m., he had fallen asleep watching television. He claimed to have no idea what happened to him during that time period. The family dog had been locked up in the basement by Nicholas earlier that evening. It had escaped and was wandering around outside, covered in blood. Some even believed to be from a human being, but only further investigation could give concrete evidence for this theory. It was believed that Nicholas was abducted by somebody. Nicholas Barclay had not been seen since the evening of January 12, 1990. Three days later, on January 15th, his shoes were discovered in a wooded area, approximately seven miles away from his home, by some children playing in the woods. This provided investigators with their first lead into discovering what happened to him. A massive search for Nicholas was conducted at this time. Bloodhounds tracked his scent to where he lived. No other evidence was found for quite some time after. They discovered many items belonging to other missing children, leading them to believe he may have fallen victim to a serial killer responsible for other abductions and murders of innocent people. As years have passed, there were several sightings of Nicholas across the country, but none have ever been confirmed, so it is unclear if any of them were legitimate. Three years later in 1994, a man claiming to be Nicholas had made contact with his family in Texas, 1,200 miles away from his actual home. He actually provided accurate details about his childhood, and he looked just like the missing boy as well. His family was ecstatic that their only son had been found, but, after DNA testing was performed, it was found that this individual could not possibly be Nicholas Barclay. The results came back negative for a positive match between him and Nicholas's mother, who believed wholeheartedly that he really was her son despite evidence showing otherwise. She refused to give up hope on finding her son alive, somewhere, all these years later. Authorities had claimed the man was 27 years old at the time of his detainment, but... When he was just 13 years old, he had weighed 90 pounds and stood 5 foot 4, meaning he would have weighed close to 130 pounds now. They also found records of him living in Spain for several years, which led them to believe this man could not possibly be Nicholas Barclay. He has since been released from custody. No charges were ever filed against him or anybody else in connection to Nicholas's disappearance. His whereabouts are unknown today. Shortly after this incident occurred, another man came forward, claiming to be Nicholas Barclay as well, this time in Miami, Florida. His claim was brought forth after a news station aired a segment uh, talking about the strange disappearance of Nicholas. But again, his claim was ruled false after investigators realized that he could not be the missing boy. Investigators have checked into other possible leads 
to discover what happened to him, such as looking into construction sites and nearby dumpsters for any evidence at all, even digging through landfills in hopes of uncovering his remains or anything else that would give insight onto where he is today. So far, they've not turned up anything. His mother also hired a private investigator two years after his disappearance, paying over $20,000 just trying to find out any information regarding where her son was or what really happened to him. But she still has no answers. Nicholas Barclay has not been seen since the evening of January 12, 1990, and his mother is still in desperate need of closure to know what really happened to her son, no matter what it may be. A swift runner, a Cree trapper who cannibalized his own family in 1879. It is one of the scariest and most well-known unsolved cases in Canadian history. It was December 4th, 1879, when Swift Runner and his native trapper crew were hunting near Fort Pitt in Alberta. They came across a Cree burial ground where they had found some graves containing smallpox victims from the 1890s. A Swift Runner became convicted that he had contracted smallpox after visiting the graves. He had run back to his camp to warn everybody about the craving for human flesh he felt coming on. He ate nothing during his time, except for boiled tallow mixed with tea leaves because he believed it would cure him of the disease. Soon after, Swift Runner went into convulsions, babbles incoherently, and then dropped dead. The men who were with him fled the site, thinking that Swift Runner had actually contracted smallpox. And due to his fear of disease, Swift Runner's family was not buried according to the Cree tradition, which entailed wrapping bodies in animal skins and placing them on scaffolds away from the settlements for a two-year period. Instead, they were all put into a single coffin within one day. Because of this hasty burial, there's an air hole about 12 inches square between the bodies, allowing researchers to take DNA samples from each body. But no evidence of foul play or specific causes of death could ultimately be determined by these tests. They did find traces of arsenic in Swift Runner's body, which was likely from the tallow he ingested. The coffin has been exhumed several times, which leads many to believe that the bodies may have been tampered with. There are no complete sets of remains. In addition to Swift Runner, three other members of his family were missing. A young man called Grey Eyes, who was also a trapper and had a wife and son. An older woman, known as Big Mary, who was related somehow to Swift Runner, but her exact relationship is unclear, and a child of about six years old, whose name is not fully documented in any written record. This case became so popular, it brought attention to Native culture at a time when white settlers were beginning to push them off their land. In fact, as Swift Runner's story is told today around Cree campfires, it serves as a cautionary tale to young hunters that you should never disrespect spirits of the land or try to deceive them. This case has brought attention to native culture at the time. The Swift Runner Massacre it might as well be Canada's most well-known unsolved case, and there are many theories about what happened in 1879 when he ran into the woods and committed his act. For example, some people believe that he was possessed by evil spirits, while others think he had delirium from drinking too much alcohol. One of the more popular theories is that Swift Runner murdered his entire family because his wife simply did not follow the Cree tradition of wearing a cap made from the bark of a red willow tree, which was believed to prevent smallpox outbreaks in their communities. In this case, Swift Runner may have murdered her and the rest of his family in order to stop them from contracting smallpox, being left alone to die, or go through a painful recovery process. Unfortunately for all involved, We'll never know what happened exactly, but many people still flock to see where it took place, so they can get an idea of how harsh life was back then for these early settlers. A number of bodies have been found in Swift Runner's coffin, but they have never been positively identified. It is believed by some people that the bodies were too disfigured to be recognizable, or it may have deteriorated significantly since water seeped into the casket after it was unearthed a few times. The full picture of what happened is still very uncertain.
The Powell family remains an incredibly disturbing case. When the Powells went out on vacation in Florida in 1978, they were more than excited. They had recently moved into their brand new home, and it felt like nothing could go wrong. The family was settled into their hotel room when Mr. David Powell called his sister-in-law, Judy, to check in on his wife and daughter, who had apparently stayed home with the baby due to health problems. According to an interview by NBC's Dateline, immediately after hanging up with her brother-in-law, she called the house, but there was no answer. Her calls kept getting sent straight to voicemail. This is when she knew something was wrong. If it wasn't for the poor reception causing issues with the phone, the pals would have answered. After calling David back to relay the message that the house phone was not working, David immediately got into his car and began driving home. When he arrived at the house, it looked as though somebody had broken in. He found out this was true when he made it to daughter Sarah's bedroom. He found a room empty with no signs of forced entry or struggle. Just like his sister, he called police who searched the house thoroughly but still found nothing suspicious except for one thing. A single set of footprints outside Sarah's window which led into the forest behind David Powell's home. The Powell's case is one of the strangest and most upsetting cold cases in recent history. For years, investigators have attempted to solve the mystery of what happened to them, but all leads will seemingly lead nowhere. What was left behind seemed to indicate an abduction, yet there were no signs of a struggle or any forced entry. This mysterious situation has puzzled authorities since 1978, when Mr. Powell reported seeing a single set of footprints near his daughter's bedroom window where she was sleeping. These same footsteps led into a forest behind his house, but stopped before they could be followed further, leading authorities to believe that perhaps they belonged to the perpetrator. The investigators who were called to the scene did their best to try and solve this case, but they have all since retired. The Powell case has become one of hundreds that are unsolved in the county of Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Brian Schaefer, a man who had no occupation besides being a college student, was last seen on April 1st, 2006. His girlfriend and friends reporting him as a missing person after they had not heard from him in three days. However, Brian's parents suspected foul play because the only thing missing was his cell phone and keys. His apartment showed no signs of a struggle or forced entry, though he did have two front doors which were chained shut to keep people out. Four years go by, and his mom finds an envelope with no return address. It's stated it was sent through the inter-office mail on March 30th, only one day before he went missing. The envelope contained two letters addressed to her, written by none other than her own son. One letter encouraged family members not to worry about him, and the other stated he'd be traveling for a while. It almost seemed like Brian had planned his own disappearance, but nobody could explain why he didn't pack any clothing or contact anybody before taking off. Another puzzle that's hard to piece together is just how many people have gone missing without a trace in Cleveland within the last decade alone. And who are they? With growing concern about human trafficking in Ohio, there seems to be evidence that these missing people were kidnapped and sold into human trafficking. The eerie thing about this case is that it's not an isolated incident. Keith Lamar disappeared under very similar circumstances, chain doors with nothing stolen but a cell phone. 30 years ago, another curious mystery was started when three young boys went missing, and to this day, their bodies were never recovered. Their disappearance is also tied into a string of other missing children. Those cases were forced into closure, even though many feel the same person that killed them is responsible for several other abductions as well. It's unknown whether these people were kidnapped by somebody they knew, or if it really was a random serial killer lurking in the shadows, waiting for his opportunity to strike again. Police still maintain active investigations about these cold cases and hope to one day solve them. So, this way, the families can have peace of mind and knowing what happened to their loved ones. Stephen Stainer, 
who was abducted at the age of seven in 1972. He was found by authorities on February 14, 1980. However, it wasn't until March 4th that Stephen was actually reunited with his own family. As a young child, under his abductor's control, he had driven across state lines to California, where he had met another boy who would eventually become his own partner in crime. Once together, they began committing crimes such as theft and vandalism. He also began receiving threats that if he didn't continue living with the man, then one of his siblings would be killed. This led to him stay even longer than anticipated. However, Stephen decided to return home after hitchhiking some 40 miles back to Ukiah, where he was originally abducted. The reason for his return was that he had become homesick. Although he became frightened, the then nine-year-old boy contacted authorities right away. It took four days before they were able to find him and bring him back home. During those days, the man who had kidnapped him made numerous death threats towards his family members in order to keep Stephen from telling anybody what had occurred during their time together. At 14 years of age, when most young boys are beginning to start dating, Stephen Stainer once again disrupted the lives of countless families after being abducted by yet another man at a shopping mall, leading to a second seven-year tenure of captivity away from his loved ones. Fortunately enough, though, this story has a happy ending, as Stephen was finally rescued. It all began when a then 21-year-old man attempted to lure a 5-year-old boy away from his mother. Before he could succeed in doing so, a stranger named Carl Proben chased him down and began fighting for custody of this young boy. This is where things became even more interesting, as it led to the kidnapping of the rescuer's wife as well. After getting into an argument with Carl about who should take custody of Jared, the little boy who had been threatened, the kidnapper ended up forcing both of them into their car trunk before speeding off. Carl was then shot in the neck, only to have the shooter drive away, not knowing that Sandy had jumped out of the trunk before hearing her husband's cry for help. The kidnapper later sent Carl a picture of Jared being tied up, accompanied with an audio cassette tape attached to it that said, now you know what happens to little boys. Jared and Stephen were both being held hostage by their abductors until they became adults and were forced to live together for five years. Eight months after Stephen's return home, though, he was yet again taken by another man. His name was Irvin Edward Murphy, and he took him from his family at gunpoint. Unfortunately, this incident didn't have a happy ending like the previous ones. Although investigators discovered human remains at certain locations months later, Stephen's real identity couldn't be confirmed until 1999, 20 years. The body that they discovered ended up being that of Irvin Edward Murphy, who had committed suicide by poisoning himself. Although some people believe that Murphy returned to killing more victims, such as Dr. Martin McNeil and even Phil Hartman, there is no known evidence to support such claims. However, it is also said that he has been connected to numerous other crimes, like the murder of Sharon Zellers and the disappearance of Scott Jeffrey, both of which occurred in Madison, Wisconsin during 1971 and 1972. Although there are criminals that like to brag about the crimes they've committed, William Lewis Reese was one of them, and he had taken things to a whole new level by not only sending taunting letters and messages to his victims' families, but also by calling them as well. This Houston-based truck driver is suspected of abducting and killing over 20 young women, beginning in the 1980s, including high school sweethearts Laura Smither and Jessica Kane, first targeting teenage girls who lived near or had ties to Oklahoma. At one point, he even confessed to murdering five girls from 91 to 97, before initially retracting his statements later on, making it harder for police to piece together evidence that had been collected. An interesting point of events, though. William was sentenced to 60 years in prison for kidnapping 19-year-old Sandra Sapo, who was forced into his truck at knife point back in 1998. This case is particularly interesting since officers were able to catch him with the help of Sandra after jumping out of a moving vehicle during a high-speed chase. Although William is currently serving time, 
there are still families who are looking for justice, as well as closure, due to the crimes he had committed. It's already been 15 years since the actual death of Kathleen Savio. You may have heard of the Illinois police sergeant, Drew Peterson, who had married several women and was hit with a murder charge. Well, Kathleen was his third and former wife. She was actually newly divorced from him at the time of her drowning. Peterson had drowned her in a bathtub on March 1st, 2004. But at the time of her death, but... At the time of her death, Peterson had already remarried and he had begun starting dating his fourth wife who goes by the name of Stacy. She was only 16 years old when they began dating and the entire time he was married to Kathleen, he was very abusive, controlling and unfaithful to say the least. But he was very crafty in his killing. He made it out to be that Kathleen had died of an accident and even her death was ruled as one despite the fact that her body bore extensive bruising and gashes on her own head. But all that was cleaned up pretty quickly. However, fast forward to 2017 and her body was actually exhumed. However, it wouldn't be till 2012 where Drew Peterson was actually convicted of her murder. And in addition to being sentenced to an entire 38 years in prison for killing her, he had also received an additional 40 years for attempting to take out a hit on the Will County State Attorney, Jim Glasgow. But his bloodshed and thirst for killing does not stop there. Even though he's already behind bars, there are many unanswered questions when it comes to the disappearance of his fourth wife, Stacy. She had vanished on October 28, 2007. And in fact, it was her disappearance that had led investigators to revisit Kathleen's murder and the case surrounding Mr. Peterson. And even today, as of 2021, Stacy Peterson's body has yet to be found. However, she is presumed dead, although Drew was never charged with any crimes against her. Though, as the years have gone on, high-profile prosecutor Marla Clark heavily speculates that he did indeed kill her. If you look back at the evidence and the way in which he had control over Stacy, very controlling and abusive, he was also this way with his previous wives, including Kathleen, but not limited to both of them. Stacy had also talked about fearing him and had been planning to tell him she wanted to separate shortly before her disappearance. Also, Stacy knew a little too much about Kathleen's death and would ultimately prove to be a liability. She also knew her husband wasn't at their home at the time it happened. It doesn't take much to put two and two together. It's also worded that apparently Peterson had coached Stacy to give a false alibi, stating that he was indeed home. Even Stacy Peterson's pastor, Reverend Neil Shorey, had testified on trial witness on the day she went missing that Stacy had personally told him, I quote, I live with a murderer. Well, at the time of her disappearance, Stacy Peterson was 23 years old. And it was because she had failed to show up at her sister's home to help her paint is when her family recognized that something was very wrong. And apparently, even Drew himself had spoken with her that same night. She apparently claimed that she was leaving him for another man. However, Mr. Peterson calmly made light of the situation claiming that it was on a regular basis that she would ask for a separation or divorce based on her menstrual cycle. Other people in Stacy's life knew that she was deathly afraid of her husband, and this has been going on before she even went missing. She'd even expressed to her friends and family that she had wanted out of the marriage and believed that Drew had not only killed Kathleen, but would also kill her. However, they did not believe that she would voluntarily leave without her young children. And even though Stacy had been married to Drew Peterson for three years by this point, her husband's abusive behavior had grown continuously worse and worse as the years had gone on. Mr. Peterson even admitted this while being interviewed on the Today Show, saying, I controlled my family, and went on to say, I think more people in America should control their family. Although his second wife claimed that he physically abused her during their entire marriage, and one such brutal two-year period in a marriage 
police had been called to the home over 18 times due to domestic disturbances. This was with his marriage with Kathleen specifically. It was evident the more they were finding out that Mr. Peterson was a monster. But because he was a police sergeant, he believed he was untouchable and could virtually get away with any crime he wanted. Grant Amato spent nights logging onto the family computer to view Sylvie, a Bulgarian webcam model that he supposedly fell in love with after losing his job. He would pay her thousands of dollars to access her sexually explicit videos and photography, even watched her dance and model for hours. He began stealing money from his relatives to keep the woman under surveillance and to give the impression he was successful and very wealthy. His family initially tried to get professional help for him. They grew tired with the lying and the stealing. He was given an ultimatum by his own parents. Stop and cut off communication with Sylvie or be forced to leave. Prosecutors responded by claiming that he had killed his brother, mother, and father in their Orlando, Florida home on January 25, 2019. Although he denied any involvement and maintained his innocence, even though a Seminole County jury convicted him of first-degree murder. A judge had sentenced him to life in prison. Amato had lived with his parents and Cody, his two brothers, before he became the local point of a sensational and sometimes bizarre murder case. He also graduated from Timber Creek High School, where he was a weightlifter, and then was going to go on to nursing school, but was ultimately rejected by the school. He was employed at Advent Health Orlando in June of 2018 and was accused of stealing drugs and improperly administering medications. During the investigation, he was fired from his job as a nurse at the hospital. He lost his job and began to spend most of his time online, surfing the internet and playing video games on his computer at home. Soon, he discovered a social media platform that allowed users to pay for sexual videos and photos. He began to watch a woman by the name of Sylvie, who her full name will not be revealed. He sent her tips, including flowers, clothes, and sex toys, in addition to spending thousands to watch her online. It was believed he was deeply infatuated and in love with her. In order to keep up his extravagant lifestyle, he began stealing money from his brother and father. It was believed that he stole over $200,000 in total from his family his family being very angry at his behavior, sending him down to South Florida Rehab Clinic for internet and sex addiction. He was to return home on January of 2019 from the facility. His father had gave him a strict set of rules that needed to be followed. He advised him to get a job, attend weekly therapy, and cease communicating with Sylvie at all costs. However, that was not what happened. He continued to speak with Sylvie his father discovered this on January 24th and was furious. He told he was supposed to pack all of his things and move out permanently. His co-workers noticed that Cody, his brother, had not shown up to work the next morning. Nobody answered their phones either. In five years, he had not missed a single day of work, especially unnoticed or a not on call. When you notice something completely out of character, that usually means something is wrong. They called the police to ask them for a wellness check. He said this, I am worried that something happened to my friend. A colleague of Cody had said to the dispatcher, I know my friend has a brother who is depressed. I believe he is suicidal. He mentioned it to me and I am very, very worried. A Seminole County officer arrived at the scene on January 25th. A Cody, who was 31 years old, was found dead on the ground with his nursing scrubs still on and his lunchbox just a few feet away. Margaret was also found dead in her desk chair, and Chad, the father, was found dead in the kitchen. Two bullet wounds were visible in his skull. Investigators located Amato and interrogated him. He claimed that his family was still alive when he last saw them, denying any allegations that he was involved in the murder. Being only 29 years old, he was then arrested by police for the murders just a few days later. The prosecution claimed that he killed each member of his family. Then, 
staged the scene in order to make it appear like Cody had committed a murder-suicide, placing a gun near him. Chad, his father, was also found with a gun on his right hip. However, because the holster was found facing Chad, he would have needed to draw the gun instead, using his left hand. He was left-handed. At the crime scene, four shell cases were also discovered. Investigators found four shell cases at the crime scene. They were not from victims who died of bullets. The murder weapon was not found. He was convicted in July of 2019. His defense lawyers claimed that prosecutors failed to present any real evidence linking him to the murders, and that the police improperly processed the crime scene. His lawyers even went on to argue that the investigators focused on Grant and did not consider any other suspects. Defense attorney Jeff Dowdy stated to the courtroom, they're just grasping for straws at this point. Their timelines don't even match up. Jurors found him guilty on July 31st, 2019. However, they rejected the death penalty and recommended he be sentenced to life in prison without any hopes of parole. Fast forward till now, he is 32 and currently being held at the Tomoka Correctional Institution in Daytona Beach. He is actually appealing his conviction. It's not entirely clear if he has had any contact with Sylvie or if she's still even working as a cam girl. Prosecutors did show jurors hundreds of photos and videos of her during the trial and for some reason they chose not to interview her for the case. Meanwhile, surviving brother Jason who was not living in the family home at the time, continues to try and process the loss and grief of his entire family. Dr. Teresa Sires was last seen alive in public in southwestern Florida International Airport. After returning from a trip with her family, her husband and two daughters, who stayed at home, then she did not appear at the clinic the following day, which led to much speculation after a few hours, the neighbor, sent by the husbands to investigate, found her bloody body on the floor of the kitchen, battered and beaten to death by an apparent hammer. She had been bashed and bludgeoned to death with a hammer. Initially, this left investigators very puzzled and confused. The house had not been ransacked at all, and a safe with more than $40,000 in full cash had gone completely untouched. This suggested that the burglary had not been a driving motive behind the bloodshed, but in fact, Dr. Sire's spouse, Mark, was out of the state, along with his daughters during the crime, thus being ruled out of any possibility of them having any connection to the crime as a member of the immediate family. There were some clues that were red herrings at the beginning of the day. Dr. Sires was an expert in holistic medicine and conspiracy theorist online mentioned to point out that two other holistic doctors were also murdered in the same time frame. This led to much speculation in local newspaper regarding possible involvement of a holistic-based medicine serial murderer. Investigators diligently followed the lead, but soon hit a brick wall. There was no trace evidence of Prosecutor Cynthia Ross. This was almost the perfect crime. It was around the two-week mark where detectives finally got themselves a lucky break. There was a tipper in Missouri who phoned in to investigators and told them that they had discovered that a Mr. Curtis Wayne Wright, who was also a professional criminal with a very, very long extensive history of convictions, had unfortunately confessed the incident to them. Investigators located Wright, and very shortly thereafter, they extended the investigation to the second suspect in question, Jimmy Ray Rogers, also a very experienced criminal with a long history of convictions as well. In the initial interview, both men denied involvement, however, and detectives were able to gather GPS information from the rental vehicle the two men taken out, which allowed investigators to establish that the duo were driving between Missouri towards Bonita Springs immediately before the incident. Their case was further supported through surveillance footage from the Florida Walmart, which showed the two men buying several suspect items that included black shoes, black towels, and a lock-picking tool. When investigators spoke to Roger's lover, Taylor Shoemaker, who informed them that Roger's admitted the killing to his girlfriend, 
She led them to the spot that Rogers had removed bloody clothes from the scene of the crime. Jimmy Ray Rogers was then sentenced to death for second-degree murder, sentenced to life in prison. Curtis Wayne Wright pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. He received only 25 years in prison, a sentence that was softer due to his willingness to expose the mastermind who was behind the attack. According to Mr. Wright, the murder had been planned by his best friend from high school, Dr. Sire's spouse, Mark, her very own husband, a man she thought she could trust with her whole life. She was wrong. Upon learning of this news, detectives and investigators were not shocked when the evidence began to accumulate more and more towards Mark. In the course of his own interrogation, his anger seemed to be overplayed and fake. We've met a lot of people who have lost a loved one, but he just seemed fake. Lieutenant David Libid had told Killer Cases. I witnessed a lot of fake favors. It did not appear to be real. Now, based on Mr. Wright's testimony, Mark actually enlisted his two accomplices to murder his own wife. He was motivated by marital issues and the anxiety about the possibility of losing custody rights to his own two daughters. The lawyer for Mark tried to convince jurors that Wright, who was the main witness for prosecution, was an insufficient source of information considering that he was the murderer and had already confessed that he had lied to the authorities before in the probe. But the prosecution also provided evidence in the trial of Mark. The data from cell phones indicated that Mark, as well as Mr. Wright, were communicating via a burner phone. For those that don't know, a burner phone is a disposable mobile phone, often used by criminals during the time preceding the death of his wife and Wright's phone was ringing close to Mark's home on the day that the murder happened. In the end, the jury was ultimately convinced by defense's explanation of the case only after four hours. They found Mark guilty of murder in the first degree and conspiring to murder. The jury that convicted Mark strongly leaned towards giving him the death penalty for his crimes. However, the Lee County judge by the name of Bruce Kyle had the final say and authority over his sentence. His decision was ultimately complicated by the plea of one of Mark's daughters, who had written and begged the court to show mercy on her father. Having already lost her mother, the young girl had argued that losing her father's life would be most unbearable. At his sentence hearing, she read from a prepared statement in which he was able to maintain his innocence and emotionally pleaded for his life. However, Judge Kyle was not affected by his plea and sentenced him to death on January 3rd, 2020. In his final quote to Mark, he says, I judge people's actions. I don't judge people's souls. If I'm wrong, hopefully, God will have mercy on us both. Mark is now currently on death row at the Florida State Prison 